Hello and welcome to my Floss Tube channel. I'm Jean Ferris and I'm so glad that we get to spend this time together. Thanks a whole lot for being here. And if you like it, please spread the word, subscribe, hit that little bell icon so that you'll get reminders. Um, first order of our business, because I forgot it the last time we were together, we still have two spots open for the Floss Tube at Sea Cruise. Now this isn't until January 2025, but it's a repeat of what we did this past January. And I just want to tell you, it was just the most relaxed and the most fun that I think I've ever had on a cruise. Um, I like all the cruises that, that we do, but the Floss Tube at Sea Cruise is a little different in that it's not itinerary driven. I almost don't even care where the ship goes. I just want to go someplace that's pleasant, has nice weather. But the most important time is that we get this um, huge chunk of time to spend together for casual stitching and to play stitch related games and just to do a smalls exchange. And so it really is much more like a hotel based cruise, but on a ship. Um, and also, it's not just a weekend, it's a whole seven days. So um, if you um, think you might be interested, check out the website. I also, a couple months ago, did a floss tube video with my two co-hosts, Michelle Bendy and the two gals from Sunside Stitchers, EJ and Sheila. And we kind of went into a lot of detail um, at that time. So at any rate, but we only have two spots left. And when they're filled, ah, that's not a word. When they're filled, <laughs> um, then that, that will be it. And we limit the space on that cruise so that everybody will have a seat at the table, so to speak. Um, the conference center is wonderful. It's big and roomy has a whole wall of windows, so we don't miss any of the wonderful scenery as we as we sail by. Um, but it, it has a limit as far as how many people we can seat comfortably. And that's why I say that there are exactly two spots that are left. So that's one piece of business. The other sort of cruise related business is I have um, a progress report on my Blackbird and the Guernsey Cow is the working um, title. I didn't get as much stitching done as I thought I would, um, but I'll also show you the work that my friend Kelly is doing. She's also stitching this, so I'll have a second sample. And um, let me show you what, what she's been doing. She's gotten a whole lot more done than I have. So um, I don't know. It's just, um, I love watching the new samplers kind of come to life and even though um, I spend more time ripping out when I'm designing something new, because as I've mentioned before, if I don't think the colors quite work, I'm gonna rip them out and, and try something else. So anyway, that's what's going on with that. And that's for the British Isles cruise. Um, today, I wanted to do a little tutorial on eyelets. Now, eyelets are one of the more traditional stitches that you find in antique samplers. And they're, and they're a wonderfully useful stitch in many other, um, you know, even a non-traditional reproduction sampler. Um, they're just a great little stitch. An eyelet, by its very definition, has a center hole, which is actually the eyelet. The eyelet, um, most of the eyelets you see in needlework are square. They can also be triangular. They can be... Um, a diamond shape, they could be round, they could be irregular, but they all have one thing in common and that is the central hole. So it can actually serve a purpose and that is um, as a place to add a ribbon or a tie of some sort. So it can actually be a very functional stitch. All of the eyelets I'm gonna talk about, and today I'm only gonna talk about two, the Algerian eyelet and the traditional square eyelet. What they all have in common, again, is the central hole, and they also have in common the stitch pathway. In all cases, the way I teach them anyway, is the eyelids go from the outside into the middle. And I, I was taught by Jenny Thompson, and those of you who are new to cross stitch, um, you, you still may have 
heard her name. Jenny is truly the, the first lady of cross-stitch in the United States. She was um, trained in Denmark. And so uh, many of the terminology and the, and the process we use for cross-stitch comes from her time that she spent with this Danish method. Um, and Jenny taught me how to do eyelets. And I loved her explanation. And um, you're going to have to just bear with me because I I don't really have like a studio. I can't like get up and demonstrate this. But when I'm in a classroom, I, 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 I stand up and I say, imagine diving into a pool. And then you get out and you take a step to the right or the left and you dive in again. And you keep going around the perimeter of the pool and each time you're diving into the middle. And that to me is the best approach to take with stitching an eyelid. Each time you take the stitch into the middle as you pull your thread um, toward the beginning of the next stitch, you're creating this eyelid. So that's one thing they have in common is again, the um, process by stitching from the outside into the middle and coming back this way. Another thing that they have in common is when you're doing multiple eyelids, the stitching goal is for that center eyelid to be a consistent size. Now, what that size is varies from project to project, varies from stitcher to stitcher. There's no one have to do it this way sort of size. But if you're going to do like an, like an Algerian eyelet alphabet, such as we have in the Janet Irving sampler, then you your goal would be for your eyelets to be consistent in terms of the size of that eyelet hole. Another consistent goal, no matter what the size or shape of the eyelet is, that as you're stitching, if you have multiple eyelets, and even when you don't have multiple eyelets, your traveling thread has to end in such a way that it doesn't clog the hole. You've spent all this time creating this nice dainty or even a larger hole to create your eyelet. And then when you go to finish that, thread, either to anchor it or to go on to the next stitch. If you clog that hole, then um, you've just sort of sabotaged your, your, your own good efforts. So that's another thing, another consistent thing to look for is as you finish the stitch, make sure that wherever you go with that thread next, whether it's to anchor it or go on to another stitch, make sure that it's not going to clog the hole. Let me think. Um, oh, another thing is that all these stitches going into the middle hole should lie side by side. So depending on how many stitches there are into that hole is also going to somewhat affect the size of the hole because you want those stitches to all lay side by side and not be on top of each other. So the two eyelids I'm going to show you today, one has eight stitches one has 16, but an eyelet can have many more stitches than that, depending on how big the eyelet is, the type of eyelet. But again, regardless of the size of the shape, your goal, your stitching goal is for the stitches in that center hole to be lying side by side and not on top of each other. Let me think. Oh, the other objective, stitch objective, is that as you're doing the pulling, you're pulling away from the middle but you're not pulling around the perimeter. So your fabric around the perimeter of your eyelid should basically be undisturbed. You're not making little pinprick holes around the perimeter. And that's kind of a tricky thing. So I would say that although to me this is a fairly simple stitch, when you're first learning how to do it, practice, practice, practice. And I would say practice doing it right and practice doing it wrong. So you yourself can see what impact the different stitch processes have on the end result. Because I think that's really the best way to learn is for you to see for yourself what difference it makes. And as always, I'm gonna say, if you look at it and you say, no, I don't see a difference, then carry on and just get the joy out of your stitching and um, don't, overwork the striving for perfection. There has to be a balance between 
doing your best and doing it with joy. So, you know, find, find that sweet spot and make sure that that's, that's where you spend your time stitching. So with all that said, um, let's get into my first demonstration, which is the Algerian eyelid. Now, Nigerian eyelet can be done on Aida, or it can be done on linen or any one of the even weaves. It's the only eyelet, in my estimation, that can be effectively done on Aida. And even as I'm hearing myself say that, I'm thinking, is that true? You could do a modified Algerian eyelet in a diamond shape, and I guess for it to work. But you'll see what I mean in just a moment. Because when you do an eyelet on linen, as I'm going to demonstrate, you have a lot more options about where to bring your needle um, at the beginning of the stitch than you do on, on Aida. And right now, I can hear people at home saying, yeah, you can. Well, yes, you could, you could struggle and do the second kind of eyelet stitch I'm going to show you, the traditional square eyelet on Aida. I personally don't think it'd be worth the effort, but again, it's your stitching time, not mine. Now, the, the first point I want to make is that I'm going to start with what I call an away waist knot. And this is a little, this is different than a buried waist knot um, in that the knot is placed away from your stitching. Um, and the rule of thumb that I use is that, that the distance between the, where you place the knot on your fabric and where you're going to stitch should be about five or six inches, which is, for most people, is the span from, from thumb to the tip of your index finger. You want at least that much thread because what we're going to do in the end is when we're done making the stitch, we clip that away waist knot, re-thread the eye of the needle, and then bury the beginning thread. I like teaching it this way because then the beginner is not struggling to bury the thread as they're stitching. Now, um, you can certainly do a buried waist knot, but when you're trying this for the first time, my recommendation is to go with the away waist knot. So with that in mind, you can see that I've placed the knot a good distance away from where I'm going to be stitching. And you may even be able to see the thread through um, the back of the fabric as, as I'm stitching. Once I take my first stitch, I'm not going to think about that waist knot at all. And I'm going to arbitrarily start at the top center of this eyelet. Now, that's the other thing I would say that's consistent. I knew I would think of two other things. When you're doing any kind of an eyelet, it doesn't really matter where you start. Um, a lot of instructions will start at the 12 o'clock position, just top center. And it doesn't really matter whether you work clockwise or counterclockwise, as long as you're consistent within a stitch. So once you start around, you don't jump around. You do you do a stitch and you do the very next stitch in the sequence and the next one, the next one, the next one going around. Or you go in this direction. It doesn't really matter. And if you're doing multiple eyelets, it also doesn't matter if you do one of them clockwise and the next one counterclockwise. It will have no impact on the way it looks. Um... And by the same token, where you start doesn't matter in terms of just doing a single eyelet. Where it will matter is when you're doing multiple eyelets, and I'll, I'll get into that later as far as explaining that why. So anyway, back to the stitching. So with um, an eyelet on Aida, the Algerian eyelet, I'm stitching each stitch in a clear Aida hole. I'm not piercing the fabric in between holes, which is why I said to me, 
the second eyelid that I'm going to show you, which has 16 stitches, doesn't work as well on Aida. So as we're going around, each stitch is going into the center. I'm pulling away from the center towards the outside of the stitch and then going into the next Aida hole. Pulling away, going into the next Aida hole until I come back to the beginning. And once I am back to the beginning, then I'm going to be able to both end the thread and bury my beginning thread, which I secured the away waist knot. So let me show you how you do that. So when I'm finished, it looks like this. You can see my waist knot up here and my stitch down here. Um, and on the back, it looks like this. So this is my beginning thread, and this is my working thread where I've ended the stitch. And um, I'm going to start with this one and thread this in the eye of my needle. In case you're wondering, I don't recommend starting with a loop start because the only way to anchor that loop start is to tug on it. And if you tug on it, then... Um, you can pull the loop around to the front. And I am stitching with, with two strands. Um, if you're stitching with something like flower thread, or again, depending on the count, if you're stitching with a single strand, then um, the system still works. If I, if I continued with the stitch, it would have come up in this direction. So that's the direction I want to take with my um, thread as I'm burrowing it. Stitches and they're they're tiny. They're going to be tiny, tight stitches. So you really have to take your time. And as I pull it, um, I'm continuing the tension of that last stitch. And um, then I'm going to turn this 90 degrees, so I can continue um, burrowing it under another couple stitches. And I would say after I've done two sides, once it's under a couple of stitches then I would say that's good enough. And you know me, um, when all is said and done, you want to clip it off close to the end. So you're not leaving any, any extra thread. Now this is my beginning thread. The length of this again is important because if it's too short, it's going to be really hard to thread and really hard to bury under uh, the existing stitches. So this was my, this was my beginning thread. So if you're doing um, single eyelets that are scattered, um, you can see that you can do this and bury bury the thread quite well. This is my beginning stitch and had I continued, it would have come down this way. So again, I want to um, kind of take it in that direction. So that's, that's the Algerian eyelet. It is So you can actually see the hole in the, in the middle of that eyelet right there. So the Algerian eyelet has eight legs, whether you're doing it on Ida or even weave or linen, it doesn't matter. That is what an Algerian eyelet is. Okay, the, one of the other things I've got to mention is an Algerian eyelet traditionally on your chart will be two squares wide and two squares high, which is why it works so well on Ida. When you're doing it on linen, you're going to make your stitches in the same points that you would have made it if it was on Aida. Or again, thinking about that chart, you're only going in, you're starting all your stitches in what would be the corner of one of the squares. So you've got your top center going in, you've got, you go over to one edge of the square, which on linen is two threads and make your stitch, you come down two threads, make the next stitch. So now let me show you the same stitch on linen. 
So again, the same principles apply. I like to start with an away waist knot. In this case, um, I'm arbitrarily picking a place to start and I am working clockwise, which I think is sort of my default direction. But it doesn't really matter whether you're going clockwise or counterclockwise. Again, I'm going to continue around and I'm going to end the thread the same way as far as burring it under existing stitches. <clears throat> but before I end this thread, I'm going to show you a traditional eyelet on linen. Now this one will have 16 stitches going into that same center hole. All the same principles apply. As you can see, the big difference is that an Algerian eyelet has eight legs and a traditional square eyelet covering the same space on your linen will have 16 legs. You go from the perimeter into the middle. You're pulling each stitch away from the middle. Um, so in, in that regard, everything's the same. The only thing different is and then I go down the side from that corner. I go down one thread and into the middle. Go down another thread, go into the middle. And again, it doesn't matter whether you're going clockwise or counterclockwise. But with a traditional eyelet on linen or even weave, you're taking a, a stitch between every linen thread around the perimeter of the square. Across the bottom, I'm again going in between every linen thread. Each time I go one thread to the left and into the middle. One thread to the left and into the middle. Not skipping um, any gap between threads. Once I get to the corner, then I'm going to go up one linen thread and into the middle. Up one linen thread and into the middle. When I'm, when I'm finished, I can simply slip my needle under existing stitches on the back. So this gives you a side-by-side -side comparison of a traditional square eyelet next to a traditional Algerian eyelet. And frankly, if there were stitches nearby that, um, let's say if there was a, 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 a traditional cross stitch motif nearby and I can get away with burrowing my thread in there, I will. As long as I am taking that, that working thread and taking it kind of in the direction it would have gone in if I had continued stitching because otherwise you end up clogging the hole and and as I said at the outset you don't want to do that after you spend all this time making either this tiny little delicate hole or this very dominant um, hole okay so that's the tutorial on Algerian eyelids and your traditional square eyelid for the day I've gotten a couple of really good FAQs lately and they are pretty quick to answer. One of them is when you're learning to stitch on linen or even weave for the first time, when you're moving from, from stitching on Aida where each stitch is one square on the chart is one square on your fabric, how, how do you count? Or I guess the question is what do you count? I teach by counting threads, not holes. And the reason is because when you start a stitch, you're in a hole and the stitch will look like it's three holes wide. It is three holes wide at the top. And that, that confuses a lot of beginner stitchers because they're saying, well, I'm supposed to be stitching over two. So if I go over two holes, if you go over two holes, you're only going over one thread. So count threads, not holes, and it'll be a lot less confusing. 
Um, next one is if I change the fabric count and go bigger, if I have a design that is done on say 14 count Aida and I want to do it on 11 count Aida, am I, use, am I going to lose detail? And the answer is no. You have the same number of stitches. That's the beauty of counted cross stitch. You can take any chart and do it on practically any count fabric. When you change the count fabric that you're stitching on, then you're not losing detail because you have the same number of stitches. You have the same design. It's either blown up or shrunk down, but the design, design is the same. The detail is the same. And that brings me to a, another uh, sort of topic, not really an FAQ. Um, what is the difference between thread count and stitch count? Thread count is how many threads there are per inch on linen or even weave. And that thread count could be anywhere. It could be 18, it could be 30, it can be 40, it could be 54. It doesn't matter. It's the number of threads per inch. When you talk about stitches per inch, that's a slightly different animal. So take that 30 count thread count linen, stitch it over two, and now it's a 15 stitches to the inch. Take the 28 count even weave, stitch it over two, and you now have 14 stitches to the inch. That same 28 count even weave stitched over one is both a thread count of 28 and a stitch count of 28. So, you know, uh, uh, there there are times, especially on say, social media, that I've been sort of taken to task for being overly zealous about language and about semantics and definitions. But you know what? When words or phrases or terms have a common definition, it's easier to communicate. When when you use a term or phrase in such a way that everybody else uses it in that same way, then everybody understands what you just said. But when you sort of make up your own definitions or muddy the waters in any way, then it gets confusing. And let's face it, most of the questions that are asked on Facebook and other social media platforms come from people that have a question. They they don't they don't know the answer. And so they're reaching out to others who know more and expecting to get a legitimate answer. And so I think I think we have a responsibility when we step up and say, hmm, I know the answer to that question, to be honest with ourselves and ask ourselves, you know, kind of what are our credentials? Do I do I really know what the answer to this question is? Here's kind of a funny, funny example. I don't know about you, but every once in a while, the mood hits me and I am watching those little short reels on Facebook. I saw one the other day that a person took an apple and they took the traditional um, wine bottle opener that has the spiral thing and the little arms that come up and they were using it to core the apple. Now, they did that, and when they pulled it out, it was a perfect cylinder. And I immediately thought, there's no way that isn't faked. That person cored that apple with a traditional apple core, which people who are in the know know that that's, it's a metal cylinder that's kind of a little sharp on the, on the bottom. So you push it into the apple, and you pull it out, and, and you've cored the apple. And that's the way we traditionally do it. You're not going to be able to do it with a corkscrew. But if I didn't know that and I watched that little reel, I'd think, huh, look at that. I can go and buy a corkscrew and I can, and I can, it's multi-use. I can use it to open a bottle of wine and I can use it to open, you know, core my apples. So, you know, just because you see it on social media doesn't make it so, which 
begs the question, do I even know what I'm talking about? And, you know, I, I feel like that I, I feel like I've kind of earned that badge. I've been doing this for 40 plus years. And I do think very, very hard about what I'm telling you. Um, and I really try to remember to say, try this. If you find a better way, do it the better way. It does. It's not a matter of doing it my way. It's a matter of finding best practices. So when you want to core that apple, the best practice is to grab an apple core, not a corkscrew. So with that in mind, stitch happy, stay safe, and I'll see you next time.